Okay, well, thank you everyone. Thank you for those who were able to make it in the light of the London Underground strike. Uh, we really appreciate those who could make it in person and welcome to all of those who could join online. Uh, welcome to the LSE for this hybrid event. So my name is Justin Parkhurst. I am the current serving chair of the LSE Global Health Initiative. And I'm also an associate professor in the Department of Health Policy here. And I'm incredibly honored and really pleased to introduce today's speaker. Um, so Winnie and her team wanted me to keep the introductions short and brief, but that's quite difficult uh, with someone uh, like Winnie. Um, she's such a remarkable individual. She, she wanted me to introduce her as an activist. Uh, but for those who don't know her and her background, I need to say a few things about what, what she's doing and what she's done before. So she's currently the executive director. Winnie Bainima is the current executive director of UNAIDS um, and, and undersecretary general of the United Nations. She's leading the UN's efforts to end AIDS by 2030. Before joining UNAIDS, uh, Ms. Bainima served as the executive director of Oxfam International um, and she was an early champion of a people's vaccine against coronavirus to be available and free of charge to everyone everywhere. Previously, she's also served in a number of important positions, including a member of the Ugandan parliament, head of the Directorate of Women, Gender and Development at the headquarters of the Africa Union, uh, director of the gender team in the Bureau for Development Policy at UNDP and the like. Um, Given the tremendous background of the speaker, it should be unsurprising perhaps for me to say it took a while for us to arrange a date for this talk. There was a lot of back and forth by emails, as you would expect. And yet, after we finally did arrange a date, uh, it soon transpired that this clashed with industrial action and the form of strike action that was going on by teaching staff in the UK higher education sector. Um, what was remarkable, but perhaps unsurprising, was that very quickly after flagging this up, the UNAIDS team discussed it and we're willing to change the date to move it to today in solidarity with the strike action. And for that, we're very thankful uh, for, for Winnie and her team for doing that. So that allows me to then bring you to the introduction for today's talk. <clears throat> the COVID-19 crisis has alerted world leaders to the urgency of stopping and preventing pandemics, which are recognized as undermining health, stability, and economic progress. But the world will not succeed in overcoming pandemics unless we address their underlying systemic drivers. In today's talk, Mrs. Bainima, Ms. Bainima will highlight lessons rooted in her ongoing experience in the AIDS response and the commonalities between AIDS and COVID pandemics to set out an approach that can actually succeed in keeping us all safe. So we look forward to hearing what you have to say on this matter. Please, Winnie Bainima. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. I think it's short, I'm short. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So, Justin, I'm really delighted to be here at LSE and welcome and thank you for coming for us to have a chat on these very important issues. As you've heard, I lead the Joint United Nations program on HIV AIDS. This is the second time I'm speaking at LSC. I was here a couple of years ago when I was the executive director of Oxfam International to speak about Africa rising. So now, those of you who are studying global health, I would say you've chosen wisely. You're going to be highly in demand. The world has been hit by a global health crisis that has turned into a social crisis, an economic crisis, a political crisis. And never before did the world actually be brought to know that our health, physical health, mental health, is so closely linked to the health of our economies. I think the whole approach to global health it's going to change, it's changing already because of this understanding. I know your interest in pandemics is not only because the topic is intellectually engrossing, but because you want to see the world safer for everyone. I share that commitment with you. We can beat pandemics. Today, we are going to discuss how to do that. The COVID crisis, has alerted world leaders to the urgency 
of stopping and preventing pandemics. As I said, this renewed attention offers an opportunity, an opportunity to provide radical solutions. But we need to be frank that this opportunity is not being seized. The path on which the world is embarking cannot succeed because it fails to address the underlying systemic drivers of pandemics. Business as usual, as we see now, will continue to fail. But we can, we can turn this around. So I'll discuss first the dangers pandemics pose, then why the current global response is insufficient, and what's required for effective pandemic response and preparedness, and how to make it happen. I start by discussing the dangers pandemics pose. We live in a world of colliding pandemics with knock-on impacts on each other. Observers warn that we have entered the pandemic era, pandemic era, with several more pandemics to come. AIDS is the deadliest pandemic of our time. 36 million people have died from AIDS-related illnesses since it broke out 40 years ago. In 2020, 680,000 people died worldwide. Every minute, a life is lost to AIDS. There's still no vaccine and there's no cure. One and a half million people were newly infected in 2021. So we still have AIDS-related deaths and new infections. Just this year, we learned of a more transmissible and damaging variant of HIV discovered by scientists in the Netherlands. Tuberculosis remains one of the world's top infectious killers. One and a half people died of TB in 2020. TB cases that are resistant to traditionally effective treatments continue to rise with nearly half a million new cases of multidrug resistant TB estimated to occur every year. COVID has killed over 5.8 million people in just a couple of years. Confirmed cases have reached over 400 million. It's continued to spread around the world. And I can see that here in the UK, you kind of have declared victory. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope it's true. Only one, however, only one in 11 people in Africa are vaccinated. Only one in 11 have a double vaccine. The damage wrought by pandemics goes well beyond the direct deaths. They disrupt the functioning of essential public services, damage the economy in ways that hit the most vulnerable hardest heighten social tension and widen inequalities. In the 90s, the impact of AIDS on social and economic development contributed to what became known as Africa's lost decade. Now, the International Chamber of Commerce estimates that delays to COVID vaccine access in developing countries will cost the global economy nine trillion dollars, huge. The COVID crisis has caused an increase in extreme poverty for the first time in the last 20 years, an increase in extreme poverty. 80 million people have gone into extreme poverty, 160 million more people have gone hungry, over 200 and 50 million people have lost their jobs. And we are not counting those who've lost their livelihoods. Those are even more than 250 million. Many health systems have been overburdened to the point of collapse. Health worker illness, 
redeployment, closings, interruptions in the supply of medicines and vaccines have all disrupted health provision. Each pandemic worsens the impact of other pandemics. That's why we talk about colliding pandemics. As a result of COVID, key HIV testing and prevention services, including programs for prevention of vertical transmission, mother to child, voluntary medical male circumcision, very effective in many in parts of Africa, especially, and PrEP have been all interrupted. Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria reported that HIV testing fell by 41% across health centers in Africa and Asia, 41% testing. Harm reduction services for people who inject drugs were disrupted in nearly two thirds of 130 count countries that UNAIDS surveyed in 2020. Progress against the AIDS pandemic was already off track before COVID. We hadn't hit the targets of 2020. Now is even under greater strain. Deaths from TB have risen for the first time in the last 10 years. So over 168 million children have lost access to school for at least a year. In my country, two years, Uganda. 11 million girls may never return to school. Pandemics worsen inequalities. 2020 saw workers lose $3.7 trillion, while billionaires at the top gained $3.9 trillion. Think about that. Those at the bottom sunk by almost the same amount as those that few at the top took, gained from a global health crisis. The world's 10 richest men have doubled their fortunes, doubled their fortunes during COVID-19. While the incomes of 99% of humanity have fallen. This is Oxfam data. Surges have been reported in gender-based violence. You would think that home is a place of safety. But when women and children came home because of lockdowns, we saw violence, gender-based violence, particularly violence against women, increase. Forced child marriages increased. Teenage pregnancies increased. In a UN women survey, seven in 10 women said that they believe that COVID pandemic has increased domestic violence. Almost one in two women reported that they or a woman they know experienced violence since COVID started. Calls to helplines have increased five times in some countries during this pandemic. Violence against and harassment of LGBTQ people has increased, as has stigma and discrimination against marginalized communities. In my country, Uganda, a group of gay men were hiding in a shelter. They are expelled from their homes, their communities hunt them down. They often find a shelter and stay there together. They were arrested and accused of transmitting COVID virus because there were too many people too close together, not respecting the public health uh, guideline of social distancing. Listen to this. People who've run away and are hiding, you arrest them because they are not social distancing. Irony of that. I went to see the president to appeal for their release. And he said to me, he says, why don't you rent them more houses so they can be four or five in each house? Rent them houses? I, I'm not in the business of renting. Who has the money to rent them houses four or five? 
So I quickly said to him that, listen, Mr. President, there is a house down the road with 40 women in that same big house. They are nuns. How come you haven't arrested them? Nuns in a convent, you know, then a light bulb. I said, okay, you've made a point. We'll look at it. They were released, but not before they had been taken through horrible anal examinations, humiliated them, and, and even tortured some of them. So we see in, in the middle of crisis like these, the persecution of people who are further persecution of people who are already marginalized and discriminated. WHO has warned that the next pandemic may be more severe. The route, the damage route by pandemics is so deep and so broad and the risks from future pandemics so grave that we can't afford not to protect ourselves. So enough about the damage. It is real and it is hardest on the most vulnerable, the people at the base. So now why the current global response, why I say it is insufficient and what effective pandemic response and preparedness would require? Why AIDS, TB, COVID and other pandemics each act in unique ways, many of the drivers of our collective vulnerability are common. A viral outbreak doesn't automatically become a global pandemic, as you know, and it doesn't always go to become an economic, a social, a political crisis like we have had. But extreme intersecting inequalities are a key part of why our world has been so vulnerable to AIDS, TB, and COVID and why they don't end. All pandemics take root. They take root in and they widen the fissures in society. The current global response fails, fails to address these inequalities and even widens them. That is why I say we are not going to beat pandemics with the business as usual approach. Inequalities written into the global trade system, for example, are preventing overwhelming majorities in many developing countries from accessing COVID-19 vaccines, enabling the pandemic to spread and the virus to mutate. The world's failure to address marginalization and unequal power is also leaving us unprepared for the pandemics of tomorrow. The amazing scientists, doctors, nurses, and communities who work to fight pandemics cannot succeed unless world leaders take the steps that will enable them to do so. What we need to do is not a mystery. We know it, not from theory, but from what we've repeatedly seen succeed across contexts. We have the lessons rooted in ongoing experience from progress and challenges in the AIDS response and other pandemics. Echoed again in the COVID crisis, we can learn from the successes and the failures in fighting HIV AIDS in the last 40 years. We can set out the core elements of an approach that will actually keep us all safe Here's what we need to do. One, we must end the inequalities in access to health technologies by spurring the best science and getting it to everyone. It's common sense, but we fail to do this. So ending the inequalities in access to health technologies. Two, ending inequalities in access to essential services by delivering on and guaranteeing health and education for everyone. There has to be access to health, to education, I should add, and social protection for everyone. 
three, ending marginalization of all four, ending marginalization of people, ending stigma and discrimination so that everyone is protected, respected and included. And fourth, to enable all these, we must support community-led and people-centered infrastructure. Those are the four things. Let's look at each. Inequalities in health technologies, access to health technologies. The denial of COVID vaccines to people in low-income countries has been so stark that South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has called it vaccine apartheid. Vaccine apartheid. And I don't think he uses the word apartheid lightly. Just 12% of people in low income countries have received at least one dose of the vaccine as compared to almost 70% in high income countries. At the end of last year, the daily number of booster doses in rich countries was six times higher than the daily number of first doses in low income countries. They would want us to believe that it is vaccine hesitancy in the low income countries. It's not true. There is vaccine hesitancy everywhere, but there's lack of access. There is lack of supply, enough supply. The WHO predicts that the COVID pandemic will last at least a year longer than it otherwise would have because poorer countries are not getting the vaccines they need. WHO also notes that this has fostered the enabling conditions for mutations, which could lead to even more dangerous variants. So we're not out of it. We must confront the fact that this inequality is built into the current global system. It's not the weakness of one individual. It's we've arrived at a situation where the rules permit monopolies, permit or endorse, condone greed that a handful of people can own a technology that is life-saving and have a right to make billions and billions and watch people die. Our system allows this, condones it, endorses it. This is where we are. Health apartheid is not unique to COVID. We are witnessing the same deadly mistakes today as were made when treatment for HIV became available. At that time, ARVs, antiretrovirals, were monopolized. And it meant that the price charged by suppliers was $10,000 per person per year, a price far out of reach for the millions of people living with HIV in the global south. And in consequence, 12 million people died before the price came down. Needlessly, 12 million people, mostly in Africa. Mass use of antiretrovirals to prevent AIDS came only when middle and low income countries defied pressure and triggered generic competition. And when global civil society pressured Western governments and companies stop to stop blocking them, it took mass action. And by the way, welcome from your action too. The struggle continues. I understand you didn't get what you were asking for, but you just keep trying. So today, some of the same big Western companies and governments who held up progress on antiretrovirals at that time are doing so again on COVID vaccines and even reusing the same discredited, disproven talking points they used at that time. I like to remind people of one very important person at USAID who justified the monopoly on antiretrovirals and denial of access by African countries 
and justified it by saying that, oh, we can't give these antiretrovirals to Africans. They don't have a sense of time. They will not be able to swallow the pills on time and they will generate resistance to ARVs. A racist argument, a racist argument. So we still have the same arguments being made about COVID vaccines. We can't produce them in Africa. There's no capacity. You cannot regulate. You can really arguments that are shameful. So indeed we are on course to repeat the story even with new HIV medicines. It's not over. That battle was fought on antiretrovirals, but there's still fights about other new HIV medicines. Opening up of production is needed to ensure that the new long acting antiretrovirals reach people not only in New York and London, but in Manila, in Freetown, in Kampala, in Maputo, in all these, in all these countries where people who live with HIV mostly live. Unless the system of monopolies is tackled and sky high prices of final products are brought down, innovative health technologies like the long acting antiretrovirals, long active, long acting prevention technologies are not set to be made available for people in most of the global south. Open up, opening up production to ensure that all these medicines are manufactured affordably by multiple producers, especially in the global south, where the disease is concentrated, will be key to ensuring equitable access and to ending AIDS. It will, not, it will be not only a moral outrage, but also a huge lost opportunity for global public health if we allow the deadly inequality in access to HIV medicines that scarred the past and even today to continue. Breaking open powerful monopolies requires a social movement. Thankfully, the movement is growing. We have what is called the People's Vaccine Alliance and I see Max Lawson here, who's one of the founders of this alliance. It is building pressure from civil society, building pressure on the companies that hold the monopolies, on the governments that host those companies and refuse to regulate them for the public good. Over 120 countries have pledged support for a TRIPS waiver for COVID. 120 countries, a temporary exception to the enforcement of intellectual property rights to help facilitate trade and production by manufacturers across the world. Agreement and implementation of the TRIPS waiver proposed by South Africa and India is urgent together with action by Western governments to use their huge leverage as procurers, as investors, as regulators over the companies they host to share the knowledge they have, the know-how and material, including through, we have what is called the WHO CTAP, the WHO COVID Technology Access Pool, and the mRNA hub in South Africa, and the vaccines, the medicines, and the tests. But the shift can't end there. Building from emergency action on COVID, we need to end inequalities in access right across health technologies by spurring the best science and getting it to everyone, investing in all health innovations as global public goods. So it's about the system, it's about changing the system, rewarding innovation differently and enabling technologies to benefit everybody at the same time. Whether the pandemic is COVID, AIDS, or the ones we may face in the future, the answer is never only just sharing doses. You know, as an African woman, I sometimes feel insulted when we are asked to believe that 
donation of the extra doses that some rich countries have will solve a global supply issue. It's insulting. It defies our, our intelligence. It is sharing the intellectual property rights and the recipes so that millions more doses can be made and delivered where they are most needed. The world cannot rely on a handful of companies to meet their health needs. We have seen on COVID the consequence of allowing companies like Pfizer to decide the pace and allocation of a global vaccination rollout. How, how can you let a handful of companies decide how much they'll produce, who they will sell to, at what price they will sell, a life-saving technology. It was inevitable. They would make life and death decisions based on their short-term interest, the short-term interest of their shareholders, and that they would create vaccine billionaires instead of vaccinating billions of people. World leaders have allowed companies such as Pfizer and Moderna to make as much as $1,000 profit, guess how often? $1,000 profit per second, per second, as their monopolies artificially restrict the supply of these vaccines, whose development was largely paid for by public money to make them the most lucrative medicines ever produced. Companies in Indonesia, Argentina, Brazil, India, South Africa, and South Korea, among others, are capable of manufacturing the vaccines if technology and know-how are shared. There are more than 100 producers worldwide that could be making the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine today, but they've not been allowed to. We cannot again go through the rounds of frustrating dialogue at the WTO, which have resulted in millions more dead, brought a deep economic crisis, and allowed a few companies to continue selecting who gets the vaccine while they make billions for themselves. We need to reform failing rules on the protection of intellectual property rights to ensure that access to life-saving science is no longer dependent on the passport you hold or the money in your pocket. The reforms should start with automatic waivers for health emergencies, automatic waivers. There shouldn't be a debate. A waiver should kick in when there's a health emergency, but must, must also go much deeper. Systems must be organized around the recognition that health is not a commodity, but a right and that the health of each person is interdependent. We need governments to have the power to establish that knowledge must be shared to protect global health. We need ways to compel companies and governments to use the WHO-led mechanisms. We need to separate incentives for in innovation from the failed system of patents, which constrains supply, perpetuates unaffordable prices, widens inequalities, and has been found to be unreliable driver of innovation. You know, there's also a myth that um, these monopolies are the way to incentivize innovation, that greed is the best incentive for innovation. A lot of rubbish. We need to challenge it. It's you people who must do that. We need to invest now in building health production capacity all over the world, especially now when there is a lull, we're seeing a lull, I'm not saying an end to COVID. We need to use this time to build capacity in all regions of the world to be able to develop and produce medicines, tests, and vaccines. We need to prioritize investment in universities and other public research institutions to enhance our technical capacity to develop medical technologies for all. The development of regional institutions, including 
the Africa Medicines Agency, a new institution, and the Partnership for Vaccine Production in Africa, and the production centers set up in emerging new hubs can pave the path to creating viably strong biomedical manufacturing across the world. But we need to ensure that this is full manufacturing production, not only fill and finish. For example, African countries have set themselves a goal of scaling up production this year and moving by 2040 from 1% to 60% production in Africa. Success requires multiplying current levels of investment through continental and international cooperation. Breaking monopolies by promoting competition and diversifying production is the self-interest of people everywhere. It's an essential part of how to beat pandemics. Pause there. So now the second one, ending inequalities in access to essential services. We have to end inequalities in access to essential services by delivering on guaranteeing health, education, and social protection for everyone. These have to be rights, not things you deliver to those whom you can and those whom you can lock out, it's okay. We cannot have user fees or other financial barriers to the right to health. This is what's going on in Africa in more than 40 countries. Ordinary people, people at the base cannot access healthcare because they don't have half a dollar. Half a dollar is prohibitive for some. There are people who live without touching money, who live subsistence lives, cannot go into a clinic because they don't have money. Through public systems, so we need to have public systems that integrate community provided services and which reach out to the most marginalized. I said, reach out. We've built health systems that ask people to reach them, but the, don't reach people. And then we call these people hard to reach. Hard to reach by who? You know, they are not hard to reach. It's the system that is not designed to reach people. We need systems of health that respect, protect, and reward fairly all the workers on whom services depend. We have systems that pay poorly health workers and don't even pay the people in communities who link communities to health services. There's an army of volunteers built by the HIV movement especially that work in communities persuading people to go for services, to stay on treatment, to go for testing, to running prevention campaigns. And all these are said to be volunteers, free of charge labor, but they are poor people. So that we have a systems of health that don't reward those who protect our health fairly. And we have to solve that. We have to build health systems that reward those who work in healthcare fairly. Systems that ensure that healthcare is there for all. We know what works. From Cabo Delgado's leadership on the elimination of vertical transmission of HIV to Cameroon's decision in 2020 to remove user fees for all health services at public health facilities, these are examples that light the way that we can take and we can scale and we can create systems that work for people. By aligning policy with the evidence of what has succeeded, we can end AIDS as we have promised. Yet we are still under investing in health across Africa, for example, despite a commitment made in Abuja 
the 2001 Abuja commitment by governments to allocate 15% of their budget to health, the average today in Africa is 7%. Only a handful of countries have gone up to 15%. With COVID, that shortfall has been worsened. Fiscal constraints have increased and debt repayments are a huge immediate threat for many African countries. Most developing countries are set to cut spending on healthcare in response to a crisis caused by a pandemic. Imagine that. In the middle of a health crisis, governments are forced to cut spending on health in order to pay back debts. So when we talk about what is wrong in the, health, in the global system, I talked about the trade rules, but there are also other rules that work to constrain governments from delivering on healthcare, such as this whole network of rules that enable, allow companies to shift their profits out of countries where they make their profits, thereby denying those countries ability to tax and spend on health. So again, there are whole gaps there in the global tax system that enable the rich to suck out profits and avoid tax payments, denying people their right to health education and so on. So there are rules, not just trade rules, but tax rules, financial rules that are skewed towards companies maximizing profit and ordinary people not getting their, their services that are their right. So we are effective public health goes well beyond healthcare, especially for tackling pandemics. Prevention and empowerment are essential. Again, these are investments that aren't being made. Universal education, for example, including secondary education, as well as pri primary, is important for healthcare. Six in seven, listen to me, six in seven adolescents, I don't know how to say that word, adolescents newly acquiring HIV among adolescents who are acquiring HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa. Six out of seven are girls, six out of seven. What an injustice. And the reason is power. Research shows that completing secondary education can reduce a girl's risk of acquiring HIV by up to 50% just by staying in a classroom, even when learning is so low, but just the safety of a classroom. And this can, the, the risk can reduce even further if you put in other interventions like taking violence out of school, like comprehensive sexuality education, you reduce the risk of a girl acquiring HIV even further. So it's key that all children, including those who dropped out because of COVID and those who were out of school even before COVID get to complete a full round of basic education, primary and secondary education. That is why we have an initiative on this. I won't give you details about that. Yet, as countries struggle with the current fiscal challenges, education and health are among the sectors that are suffering the biggest budget cuts. Since March, 2020, while high income countries deployed massive amounts over $17 trillion to protect themselves from COVID, solidarity expressed through overseas development assistance increased by just 15 billion US dollars. Meanwhile, debt relief has only been small and temporary and private creditors just stepped aside. They wouldn't change their, they wouldn't do any debt restructuring. As UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres put it, global solidarity is missing in action. 
international donors have to step up with support at the time of the worst crisis in decades. And this is where I say rules that don't work. The international financial institutions were created to protect countries from economic shocks. They too have over the last 30 years built rules that actually don't prevent the weakest economies from economic shocks. That's why there is no framework for debt restructuring, even in the middle of a crisis. The IMF is not able to bail out the countries that are now in debt distress, has no way to bring together all the various creditors so that they can sit together with the indebted countries and find a solution in the middle of a crisis. Nothing, no tools for that, except they have ways to help companies to access public money to make more profits for themselves. So we have a problem in the global financial architecture as well. So as well as upholding the 0.78 commitment, there's no, there is need to reform aid to more fully reflect solidarity over charity. There's a growing conversation on global public investment to shift from a colonial mode of fighting against poverty to a more solidarity-based model, global public investment. The majority of the recently issued 600, I'm talking about the IFI, 650 billion special drawing rights that were issued in the crisis by the IMF could and should be shared more equitably to developing countries. But again, they cite the rules that these, these SDRs cannot be given, that they have to be borrowed, but you can't be borrowing when you're already heavily indebted and so on. Debt cancellation is a crucial component. It's time for a legally binding agreement which encompasses all low and middle income countries and all categories of lender, including private and multilateral creditors, as well as governments that will not only hold debt repayment for the duration of the crisis, but also provide for a comprehensive fair debt restructuring and debt resolution mechanism, ensuring that developing countries have sustainable fiscal space requires, as I mentioned earlier, a global tax reform to increase the minimum corporate tax rate from 15 to 25% to ensure companies and individuals cannot hide their revenues, must pay taxes where profits are made and provide for taxes on excess profits and on millionaire and billionaire wealth. If we do not find the money for universal essential services, we will all pay a much higher price as a consequence. The third, ending marginalization and all forms of stigma and discrimination. Discrimination and marginalization perpetuates pandemics. In contrast, human rights are central to effective pandemic preparedness and response. We've learned that in the fight against HIV. When people fear the state, many will hide from it. When people fear public shaming, many will seek to prevent themselves from being seen. Marginalized ethnic groups have been hardest hit by COVID. Gay men and other men who have sex with men, transgender women, sex workers, and people who use drugs face up to 35 times greater risk of acquiring HIV worldwide, worldwide. The data proves that punitive laws are hurting countries' ability to end AIDS. Stigma and discrimination against marginalized communities is a barrier also to ending COVID. In countries where laws criminalize gay men, they are twice as much at risk of acquiring HIV compared to countries where 
they are not criminalized. This is our data. This applies even when such laws are not operationalized into arrests. Even when the law is ignored, just having the law there increases that vulnerability. At least one in three reporting countries said that more than 10% of all groups at risk of HIV avoided healthcare. Punitive laws, discrimination, and other forms of exclusion fuel vulnerability to disease, to poverty, and ill health. The ability of communities to protect themselves depends on their ability to exercise their human rights. Progress has been fastest when countries have not only repealed stigmatizing laws, but have also enacted laws that advance human rights protections. We see this correlation strongly. Law reform to protect every person's human rights is essential to effective pandemic response and preparedness. Essential to, and, and by the way, I can talk about Ukraine, that right now, UNAIDS teams are helping to evacuate leaders of gay communities, leaders of groups of sex workers, youth leaders, leaders of networks of youth living with HIV. They are at risk. They are on lists of people who will be arrested when uh, their towns are, are, uh, are overwhelmed by the Russian invasion. Clearly, you see that where you have human rights suspended, then you have communities that are at risk, communities that are marginalized and that are stigmatized will be the first to suffer and to lose their, their right to health. So essential to our vibrant, independent human rights organizations to advocate for reform, to bring rights violations to public attention and to strengthen accountability. So it's these leaders that you need to advance the right of everyone to health. And it is these leaders who are the target whenever the rule of law collapses. Ensuring long-term core funding for human rights groups is an important investment in global pandemic preparedness. In times of crisis, some in power have shown a, ten a tendency to treat human rights as they are in the way of the risk. And, and, and they use this argument, public safety, public health regulations. They use an argument of suspend human rights for public safety. We argue that there's no such a thing, that human rights are never suspended in the interest of public health you do not suspend human rights. You might impose regulations for a limited time that help to uh, prevent the spread of a disease, but it is not a suspension of human rights. Supporting community-led was my last point, and people-centered infrastructure. What do I mean? Beating pandemics depends not only on what policies are pursued, but also how they are pursued. The evidence is clear that the most crucial enabler of implementation is community-led and people-centered infrastructure. Where countries' policies have allowed civil society to deliver, civil society organizations to deliver treatment for HIV, HIV treatment coverage has grown much faster and, and has been more resilient to disruptions where it is controlled and driven by civil society. During COVID, community groups from Cote d'Ivoire to Indonesia successfully delivered ARVs and TB medicines to people's homes or to, to drop-in centers. In Eswatini and Kenya, civil society groups have delivered condoms, 
lubricants and HIV self testing kits to key populations. Key populations are the groups that are at risk of HIV. Not only has this infrastructure been mobilized to ensure service continuity, it's helped to fight stigma and misinformation about HIV and about COVID. Such networks critical for effective pandemic response are too often overlooked, neglected or pushed aside. Communities who know the situation on the ground and have the essential relationships of trust need to be given the resources and the space to lead. Countries need to ensure an enabling environment for communities to be involved in providing services as a part of public health response, to be involved as co-planners, to be able to highlight their experiences and concerns, and be able to play an oversight role, hold governments accountable. Countries need to lift those legal policy and program barriers that hold this back and to fund communities. So while the international community often responds to crisis by establishing new mechanisms, new rules, it's also important to leverage existing experience, networks, capacities of communities. Indeed, if we start with human beings listening to them about the capacities they bring and supporting them, we develop more workable solutions for pandemic preparedness. Today, there's a process going on in Geneva where I live and work of negotiating a pandemic treaty. I'm sad that in that negotiation, civil society is not represented in spite of the fact that we have huge networks, global networks of people working on public health issues, global health issues, but civil society is not at the table there. I am there hoping to be the one to speak for them, but I'm not civil society, I'm the UN. So we need to have civil society able to shape global rules, national rules, community guidelines for fighting pandemics. We need, excuse me, we're just getting quite low on time. I need to stop, yeah, you're right. So let, let me summarize. Communities are demanding that we join up our thinking and our practice in tackling pandemics and avoid parallel system. So, all this is possible. One lesson, hopeful lesson from history is that it's often been in times of crisis that leaders have found the opportunity to make long overdue transformative change. With growing attention to the ways inequalities drive pandemics, we have a window of opportunity in which to build rights-based human-focused responses to save millions of lives, to beat pandemics and to build pandemic resilient future. But this is possible only if leaders seize the opportunity by working courageously together to tackle the inequalities that endanger us all. We don't have time. Inequalities are putting us ever more in danger. If we don't make bold reforms and investments now, we will all pay the price for many decades ahead. And while some leaders are stepping up, others need a nudge. Accountability is key to ending pandemics. Health, like justice, is never merely given, it's always won. It's a right, it has to be won. My most important message today is that the evidence shows that we can win if we take on the inequalities that hold back progress. We can deliver on the promise to beat the pandemics we have today and to be prepared for pandemic risks to come. I'm sorry I've taken so long, but thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. I apologize for having to, to interrupt you there. Um, mm, I know you okay. wanted to have some time for, for, for Q&A. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So thank you all for listening and for joining us. We'll open the floor now uh, for questions. Um, I believe some have come in, uh, or Stephanie might be looking at the online uh, to see if there's any uh, Q&A, you could post them online, but also if there are any in the room. Um, in the interest of time, I might suggest taking two, one or two at a time, uh, or, or batching them, uh, and then uh, asking them. So let me see if there's any in the audience today um, who would like to. Please, can I start here? And microphones will be coming to you. Uh, uh, and, sorry, excuse me, please uh, introduce yourself oh, and let yeah. us know um, uh, what, what your affiliation is. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Clarissa Magdalena. I'm uh, a student in the Global Health Policy course here in LSE. Um, thank you so much for uh, the explanation and all the insights. I want to ask, um, we talk a lot about changing the systems, right? And usually that requires that the current leaders um, invest in changing the systems that would allow us to see uh, the results, but sometimes the results uh, would not be uh, present now, but in the future. And sometimes that means that there will be no political incentives for the political leaders uh, to invest in strengthening the health system and investing in the community workers and so on. Um, so uh, from the current evidence, uh, uh, from your work experience, how then to make the political incentive and how to make the leaders um, invest in the... Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Two questions at a yeah. time, but I, I think there's another hand here. Actually, we'll take three, so one, two, and then third here, and then one. Hello, uh, my name is Amit Mato. I'm from India, and I'm studying Masters in Health Policy Planning and Financing here. Very evocative talk, thank you, Winnie. Uh, my question is, um, so, I felt three things, and I think they're all related in one direction. One is, um, I think you were trying to say that we need to build uh, resilient societies, not only resilient health systems. The second is, um, so we study a framework of health in all policies, but my uh, understanding is that we see different health policies, like social and public policies, and we see, oh, they have an element of health, that's health in all policies. But my question is, how do we proactively pursue health in all policies and make policies which have health, even social and public policies? And the third thing is uh, uh, that I thought was, uh, so health has many determinants, legal, commercial, social, and you talked, uh, elaborated on them a lot. So how do we, and I think my question is partly related to Clarissa in a way, how have you in your work navigated this um, being at UNAIDS to be able to influence these laws and uh, this legal frameworks and commercial interests, because it seems like uh, so entrenched and so difficult to go through as a, as a student mind. So how have you accomplished that in your work to be able to have that influence? Thank you. Okay, so it, let's try not to put in too many questions in each individual one, but <laughs> I, think, I think it all touches on key themes there. Mm -hmm. And yeah, one, one more here from the audience. Thank you. Um, I'm Itamar, I'm from Mexico, and I'm doing the Health and International Development Program here at LSC. Um, we, for, first of all, thank you very much for being here. It's really inspiring. And I have one question. Um, we talked about how it is important to enable community to work in this kind of situation. So I was just wondering what kind of permanent changes uh, or adaptations have been made uh, at UNAIDS or in the HIV services uh, as a result of the pandemic? Sorry, so I, you have to speak a bit more slowly. Oh, I don't sorry. always, I, I don't, uh, English isn't my first language. The question okay. is what changes have been made? Yeah, the permanent changes uh, or adaptations. Uh, that have been made at UNAIDS, UNAIDS and or HIV services in relation to, yeah. in relation to the pandemic. Oh, okay. Is that okay to start yes. with those and yes. just whichever you wish to? And well, first I want to introduce my colleague, Max Lawson, with whom we founded the People's Vaccine Alliance and wave Max. Uh, and then uh, also my colleague Kata, work with at UNAIDS, Joel and, and Charles here. So, and they can also chip in and answer some of these questions. 
the first question, as I understood it, you're talking about the political incentives to make the big changes, the big shifts I was talking about that will close those inequalities that drive pandemics. So you're referring to the short-termism of our politicians. They have a five-year term or whatever term, and they do not have an interest in making fundamental changes that will give us long-term gains. That's a real challenge. Let me say what we have learned. As I said, there's an opportunity in crisis. When we, see, when we look back, we see that big changes that led to the right to health care for all people tend to have tended to happen in situations of crisis. You, I'm sure you're all here on the National Health Service of this country, greatly admired model of public health care that came to be after the Second World War, a crisis had brought the country and countries here in Europe on their, to their knees. And out of that came the National Health Service. By the way, I'm, I also still have my number. Mm -hmm. I had a card when I came here as a refugee back in the 70s. To this day, if I go to a health system, a clinic here, I will still be treated. They've never removed me. <laughs> Yes, so that's many, many years. So that is a health system that's based on the right to health. Even in countries, developing countries like Thailand, Thailand moved, made big changes to develop a public health care system where almost everybody has full access. And that also came during or shortly after the financial crisis that hit the world and the Asian countries. So there are many examples, and I can ask my colleagues to show that crisis is an important incentive that makes leaders rise and go beyond uh, thinking about the next election to addressing big problems in society. So that's why I see an opportunity now. I see opportunity now. Um, question of health in all policies. Health in all policies, a very important question you've raised. Huh? In my remarks, I talked about the protective effect of schooling for girls. It's so important, you're right, that we have an integrated approach to solving development problems. We now are trying very hard to say that, to persuade governments that your investments in, edu first of all, step up your investments in education in order to protect the health of girls, to remove the risk of girls to, to HIV. And we're saying you can do this by using the same amount of money, but using it in ways that increase that uh, strengthen the health of girls, that give them an or empowerment, that take out violence from schools, that give you... So finding ways to integrate and layer different... Uh, how can I put it? Trying to find ways to bring health into education is exactly what we're trying to do. We're saying your health expenditure can also protect the health of girls. And that you can also, we also have evidence that layering different interventions from education to violence prevention, to income generation, in skills for, for uh, employment, that pulling this together using the same funding can give you multiple results. So there is absolutely a need to re to have a, a fresh look at how and, and breaking the silos between different sectors and looking at problems in a more integrated way. I think the sustainable development goals are an attempt to do that, to have 
countries focus on what is the problem we have and how do we link things up so that we get a, a synergic effect. So you're right, putting health across different sectoral, uh, different sectors is the way to go, is, is very important. And I, I give you the example of our Education Plus initiative. Laws and influence, uh -huh, you ask about us in the, at UNAIDS, how we influence laws, was that the question? And policies? Yeah, of course, uh, or other than health policy, the laws, for example, finance. Yes, yeah, you, you're, you're quite right. So we, my, I see myself as an activist. I see every platform I have as an opportunity to make the world better, to influence change, to make lives better for others. So I always work with others. I don't take a narrow mandate and focus there. I connect things. So I work through alliances. That's why I'm part of a People's Vaccine Alliance that is working on changing trade rules, changing trade rules because trade rules are a barrier to access to health technologies. I will be working and I'm already building up a capacity to work with people who want to shift the rules, change the rules, the global financial rules, so that we have a framework to restructure debt and to secure countries that are in economic shocks, that face severe economic shocks. That is an alliance we will build, and we, there are already some alliances there, but I'm building UNAIDS capacity to be part of those alliances to fight on issues of the global financial architecture, because that affects our ability, country's ability to pay for healthcare. Equally, I'm part of a huge movement of people who work on tax justice issues, because a big reason why countries don't provide healthcare and charge user fees is because they can't tax. They're unable to tax because global rules have allowed those with capital to ship it out, ship out their profits and not pay tax. I'm part of those movements and I'm trying to get UNAIDS through building its area on financing pandemics, financing health, to be part of those movements. You can't do anything alone. You need to be part of other movements. But it is difficult because our institutions are structured in a way that have very narrow mandates. And that does not help to bring about big change. You need to work across mandates in big and create big forces for change. So you asked the right question. We've got one more question from the audience. I just want to take a second. Was the technical end time meant to be quarter past or yeah. half past? Quarter past. But so uh, we're at the time, but I think if it's okay, if you're happy to take this question, and if I'd love yes. to take one or two from online as well, if you're happy to run over a few more minutes. Um, I'm willing to, Thank but you. her question is so important. What has changed in response to COVID? To tell you the truth, the most exciting innovations and changes that have happened have happened at the community level. Communities have really, really uh, surprised and humbled us because on their own, they found solutions to the challenges they were facing with COVID. For example, we had communities moving to find ways of delivering ARVs to people without breaking the regulations on restrictions on movement. We had the communities demanding and getting the system to change towards what is called multi-month dispensing, MMD, where they were coming every month to get their pills they demanded and started getting pills for say six months so that they, they avoid moving and going to a clinic and getting infected. These changes, many, many changes. We had 
the communities accessing social protection, denied social protection, finding ways around getting social protection and reaching everyone who can't get it. You really saw the innovations of people at the base to make services work for them in the midst of COVID. So that's just briefly about the changes that have. And for us too, at um, our level, we had to reconsider guidelines about uh, the delivery of services to change them in order to, to manage. But the biggest, biggest innovations, as I said, are at the national level where you saw government officials, academics, communities coming together to use what they have learned from HIV to fight COVID. Do you remember the first, uh, in the first phase when there was this test, what was it called? Seeking out, finding the- Test, trace, isolate. Trace, uh, yeah. Yeah, test, trace, and isolate. Test, test trace, and isolate. That whole process in some countries was actually done by people who had been trained and had been in the trenches supporting HIV prevention programs. That, that was just people getting up and saying, I know how to do this and volunteering to do it. Connecting science with the communities were the ones working with scientists to isolate the variants. When Omicron was found, Delta was found, this was done by HIV scientists working with communities to isolate the, the variants that were coming. So there's so much that was inspiring and that was happening at the base and innovations. Thank you. So I, we, are, we are over time, but if people are willing, if you're having, I know some students have classes to get to, but I want to, very often the online, online. audience is getting yeah. and more than, more than double are online than we have, I think, here. So yeah. Stephanie, yeah. I don't know if you've been able to, man, to, to monitor if there are any questions and maybe just pull out two, uh, if that's okay. Um, and, and let's give a chance for those questions to be heard. So we have a question from Aklima Oras, who is a um, global health policy student. She asks, the number of deaths as a result of HIV AIDS has declined dramatically for the past 20 years. What do you think has contributed to such positive improvements? Perhaps the policies could be replicated elsewhere? And Owen Wilson, an LEC student, asks, you spoke about the need to allow technologies to benefit everyone at the same time. Do you think a World Health Organization pandemic treaty would achieve this? Oh, good questions. On deaths, AIDS deaths have decreased. Yes, dramatically in the last 10 years. And that has been largely because of increasing access to antiretrovirals. Because when someone takes antiretrovirals regularly, then they, they can live a long and healthy life. The fact that the price came down and they were rolled out and people in developing countries can get it for free was the most important factor for the reductions in deaths. So it's again an example of why we must have full and equal access to health technologies by everybody. In countries where uh, people have gone on antiretrovirals, there's epidemic control. But in countries where people are not able to go to get on treatment, they continue to transmit and you, you continue to get new infections. So that's important. The second question on the pandemic treaty, I'm sorry to give an answer that I'm not, so opt I'm not optimistic at all. In fact, I don't think the pandemic treaty will um, be the solution. It might help us if it is successful to share uh, information and to be able to um, isolate a virus and be able to move quickly towards uh, prevention. 
But unless there are other changes, like I mentioned, in access to health technologies, access to services, you will still get countries that are not ready. You may have information out there. You may even move quickly to get a, a, a solution, a, a medicine or a vaccine, but it won't reach everybody quickly enough to stop a pandemic spreading. So we need the pandemics treaty, but we need more than that. Okay, I think unfortunately I have to draw it to a close in the interest of time. Um, but thank you so much for your talk. Uh, we would love to keep you as a regular speaker here. I think you touched on issues that cut across so much of the work that scholars at, at LSE are trying to understand the centers on inequalities, on gender, global health, international development. Um, and I'm sure you can speak to any one of the four points that you talked about uh, at length. So if you're ever passing through again and would like to speak to us again, we'd be more than happy to, to host you again. So thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you to the audience. Thank you for those who joined us online. Um, please a round of applause for our speaker today. Thank you.